Welcome back to my virtual table talk. My name is Hayden Luz, also known as Last Round, Last Round Luz on all social media platforms. I'm joined today by New England's own Rico DeShulo to talk a little bit about him and, of course, the experience on the Ultimate Fighter. How's it going, Rico? What's going on, man? It's going good. Ah, it's good to hear, man. Uh, so before we hop into the tough talk, talk to us a little bit about how you found MMA and uh, how you were able to sustain such a long and still ongoing career. Yeah, so uh, growing up, you know, I started doing karate, like, super young. Like, I think I was, like, four or five when I started doing karate and kind of started getting the bug like that. So I got into – I started doing karate for a long time, stuck with that for a while. Then, uh, you know, as you get a little older, you want to do, like, traditional sports. You want to play baseball, basketball, football, hockey. I pretty much did everything. You know, my mom, mm -hmm. God bless her, used to drive around town all over the place just to get me to practices because I was, like, a super active kid. You know, I, I literally mm -hmm. would – Play a sport I didn't even know how to play, and I'd get picked by the coaches for like a traveling team. I didn't even know how to play. Dude. Like I played literally. That's how I played soccer. I, I would show up. I didn't even know the rules, and they just picked me for a traveling team. So next yeah, week, I'm, I'm I'm playing like a traveling team soccer, and I didn't even know the fucking rules. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> just a I was, natural Boston athlete. Yeah, I mean, I just loved sports so much. Like that's the difference. I think the thing that makes good athletes like great is like if you truly love it, like it's in your DNA, like you're super passionate about it. That's what makes like an okay guy, like really good because they'll do those things above and beyond. Like, you know, they'll be diving for plays. They'll be all over the place because they just, it's like a dog with a bone. You know what I mean? You're just, you're just chasing. For sure. So, um, you know, after a while of, uh, you're just doing regular sports and whatnot, play lacrosse in high school. We wanted, you know, uh, you know, we were really good. We wanted, I think we were GBL champs that year. I moved to Everett cause I have a business over there and I was kind of in between going to college and, not sure if I was going to play college, you know, play college cross and I was going to go to school, if I was going to stick around doing business, you know, for my business. And I, um, I ended up moved to Somerville, which is a block away from, uh, Mark DeLaGratis gym, which is City of Town, which was at the time, especially, and it's still now literally one of the best gyms in the entire, you know, country mm -hmm. for striking, you know, people come in from all over the place to go there for, you know, for fantastic rounds, but it wasn't really like the type of gym that it was, you know, solely striking at that time for the most part. It was like really good, like Muay Thai learning, Muay Thai, and, uh, yep. and MMA. And um, then they brought in like Giuliano Catinu, who had black belt under uh, Daniel Gracie, which is our affiliate. So now they started in a jiu-jitsu program. But yeah, I mean, I started over there, and um, you know, literally was going for a job. And uh, I ran into Sitio Tong, and I, you know, I saw everybody hit the bags and whatnot. And I, I went and walked in one day, ran into the late great crew Eric, and. Um, yeah, it's pretty much that's been a wrap. I signed up the next day, you know, and I trained for two, about two years, had a couple in-house smokers, which are like fights, but that like kind of pretty much exhibitions right. and just mop the floor with some people. And they were like, all right, this kid can fight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. And that's kind of a good way to set up my next question being, what was it like being on the show representing Boston in the gyms like Sit Your Tongue, Broadway BJJ and Eddie Alvarez boxing kind of bring us into the living and training habits that you went through while you were there? Yeah, so, like, it's funny, man, because, like, a whole bunch of my professional footage really isn't even out there. So I don't think, like, a lot of these guys really knew who, like, what the For deal sure. was. I tried I got to some, look and I couldn't find one. Listen, I got some vicious, vicious knockouts. Like, I fought for Bellator the first fight I fought. Kid had, like, five, six profile. I fucking left him, you know, I don't think he ever fought again. You know, kid left in a stretcher. I've had some crazy highlight reel finishes. I got to work on getting those videos back. Yeah, but I think right. it was a it was a blessing in a way too because it's like all these guys are looking at that video from ten years ago thinking I'm the same exact person you know so they don't really realize you know my jujitsu and my wrestling that I've been putting in and all the work that for that for like years you know and uh, you know especially like I know what kind of you know once you know the style of fighter you're gonna get involved with you kind of know where the, where they want to take the fight so it kind of eases things even if it's potentially a harder matchup mm -hmm. but um, the training in in uh, for the show was it was great man I, I loved it personally because you know we didn't really have any distractions you know you you wake up in the morning you get your breakfast or whatever you wrote on a list for food whatever you really wanted um you go to the gym you come back you sit in a hot tub you sit in your sauna yeah. you just decompress you get your ball you stretch out you relax like i don't have to go run a job i don't gotta go take care of my kids i don't gotta do all mm -hmm. this stuff I, so for me it was like you know i look back at it like it was really really stressful environment but like after a couple of days, man, I was in my element. I was like, this is like, yeah. this is a breeze. You know, I could do this all year round, you know? And uh, it just, it just made me hyper-focus on the training and the fighting, which was everything, you know? And that's really why, you know, everybody was there. Like there was no, everybody on that entire show was professional through and through the season. Like we had 3000 bottles of liquor all over the place. Not even oh, people, no people, people even cracked it till like after their fights. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. 
proper 12 sponsored the whole thing and there was also a bunch of booze all over the place but like you've seen past episodes people get drunk and stupid shit happens yeah. everybody was super professional on this one for sure like everybody had a goal you know and they were all like dialed in to make sure it happened yeah, that's cool and that kind of just like just to kind of go on to that how was it like working with like the old Roddy's and the John Cavanaugh's and especially Connor? Is he like everything he's cracked up to be? Yeah, I mean to be honest, man, like, dude, he's a he, I'm like a high energy guy from from what I from people say, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and I just I don't know, I just I clicked with him like instantly, just like I understand what he was trying to teach and things like that. I feel like people with like a striking background, I don't know. I, especially the way that I move, like I can set up things from Southpaw. I can, I can do things that and kind of emulate things that he does. So like, you know, a lot of things that he does is like he pulls people into the power without them really knowing it. And I can do that righty or lefty. And it was kind of a part of why that, how that fight set up. You know what I mean? Like I did a lot of stuff working with my boxing coach before we left on like luring people into, into power shots without them really even knowing with like little angle changes and things that are very subtle to the naked eye. But like, once you, you know your range and you know how you break it down. You know, it's a big, big, big part of, of fighting at a high level. You really can't, you know, you got to, if you can do that, if you can like, you know, start to put people in your position, like the, the position you want to land your big strikes without them really knowing, you know, it makes it a lot easier and you're not forcing it, you know, yeah, keeping yourself and, in good range, you know, so like they can't counter back either, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I feel like, like you're saying, like, it's a very high level tactic. And I think Connor said that on the show, once you get to that level, you're at world championship level. And yeah. someone that does that very well is Connor and guys like Pierre de Jan as well. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Who manages their range, very good balance, can switch. It's a, a pure switch hitter, can go equally from both sides. And I see yeah. a lot of that in you. Good long boxing combinations as well. Um, but that brings me to my next question is, what was kind of the reception coming home and, and going back to the gym? Did you get this big like hero's welcome? And did you bring any, like, training practices back to Sydney Tongue? Yeah, so for the most part, like, I was – the stuff that I was working on before I left was kind of what we worked on in there, which was wild. Like, what for the, the game plan for, Yeah, for the game plan for one of the fight, like, you know, me and I was working with um, with Coach Owen, you know, we were doing a lot of stuff with, like, the lead hand posts, you know, to keep your range. And it, I didn't really do as much of the fight. I was doing it as, like, a subtle jab, but it's pretty much the same thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's just, like, working off that jab just to like, keep – something out there to get your range together and it's something i work on in the gym all the time like really like framing off of your opponent to set up other shots and just to keep them at bay if they come in you can stuff them you know what i mean just really mm-hmm. really dialing in your range to a point where it's like automatic you know what i mean and it's funny because like it transferred over so great and then we started doing twist and drills which we do here all the time on these um i forget what they're called but there's like these wooden planks that you put on the ground and you kind of step on them and they're off balance a little bit. So it keeps you from lifting and, and lifting with your feet. So it makes you kind of like really take the power from the floor and use like, kind of like how you see Canelo really rotate from his upper body and like yeah. really use that, the, the ground to get that like big rotation in his strikes, like, you know? And um, mm-hmm. I think it makes it for cleaner, crisper, you know, striking. And it makes those power punches come without trying. You know what I mean? You don't have to, because when you try to muscle a big power punch, you know, you're flexing your arms, you're flexing your muscles. It's not really going to be as smooth, and it's going to be telegraphed. You know what I mean? You need yeah. to be get 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 there quick, and it's got to be loose, and that force is going to travel from the ground up. You know what I mean? That's how you get those those big shots, and uh, it's it's awesome because it all translated. You know what I mean? But what were some of the hottest challenges you encountered on the show? Whether it be mentally or physically? So they they messed up with my medicals a bunch of time, a couple of times. So like right before oh, fights, I, I had to get like saline like put in me the day before the weigh-ins. So like it's like a saline thing that they go and they do like scans throughout your whole body for certain stuff. I, I don't even know what it was because I went so many times. I was just yeah. like, get this, get this done, please. I don't know if there was like an error on the paperwork if I did it or somebody maybe messed up like birth something simple. But I know I had to get it done a couple times, and it was like literally crunch time. It's literally the days before. I think it was the day before the weigh-ins. I had to get this saline put in me, and my coach was like, they he's like you don't understand that's all sodium that's like the last right. thing you want in your body like before a weight cut and he was like wondering why the last couple of pounds were a little tough the next time it was 10 times easier but i knew like myself i knew like i didn't even honestly i put that out somewhere else i'm making a weight no matter what you know what i mean like mm-hmm. that wasn't really I, everything was great until that last like pound or two but i could tell it was a difference because like the body doesn't just stop sweating like that it's never done that so i told my coach about it and he was just like dude you don't understand what that is. Like that stuff that's in there is like really not good for you. <laughs> but yeah. it was what it was. So I, and then I had to go home and I had to drink a bunch of water to flush it. So like I'm gaining, you know what I mean? So like I'm supposed to be like cutting the water at this time, but I had to like flush the water, like at, drink a bunch of extra water 
So I really wasn't even like dehydrated yet. You know what I mean? Cause I had to flush that stuff out of me a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it, it just made a hiccup on time. Like all it really was, was we're battling time for the weigh-ins. It wasn't, I didn't, I don't even think it really made my week up that much harder. I think it was just, you know, we're crunching time. So we had to push it faster, which made yeah. it a little harder. You know what I mean? It's, it was another hurdle, wasn't it? It was just uh, one of those situations. Yeah, man. But um, was, I mean, that was funky. Yeah, no, I mean, that's actually kind of a good segue into my next question. Uh, talk to us about some of the emotions going up against not only their number one guy with USC experience, but being that true underdog that flew underneath the radar because you were a little bit low key on the show and uh, being that saving grace for your team. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, in my career fighting around New England, like everybody around here knows me. Everybody knows around here, like I bring the heat. I'm coming to take, you know, I'm coming up to do some damage, put on a show, and finish fights. And everybody around here knows me. Outside of that, maybe in Florida, because I fought in Mark Rise of the Warrior down there when I was an amateur, took down that whole tournament, you know, pretty quick with, like, all finishes, you know what I mean? So, like, yeah. here, here in Florida, know me. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. everywhere else, I'm just, like, a complete unknown, really, to be honest. So it's, like, I like that. I, I'm, I'm almost, like, so used to, like, being in those huge pressure fights that I got everybody – from town like around like cheering for me and wanting me to win so it's like those are almost more pressure to me you can fly me and fight the number one guy in the world and i'll probably have less pressure on me than i do at home you know what i'm saying yeah exactly. so it's like I, I don't mind being the underdog i've been putting in the work for years and i've trained with some of the best on the planet like over and over and over so like the confidence you get from built like training with like elite level guys like all the time makes you like in those moments it's just another day in the office you know if, and if anything once they realize how much better you are than they think that you are, it can really be a momentum shift. And they're like, I, I, you know, I could feel that energy in there. Like, Oh, this dude don't realize like what he's in for. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah. Cause looking back at your, uh, at your, at your pro resume anyways, you have 11 wins and you have eight stoppages too. And not for nothing. You're fighting guys with records like seven and three Hunter was 10 and three, eight and four. Like, you know, you fought a lot of tough, tough guys and you're finishing these guys as well. Yeah. And as an amateur, I fought literally the best people they were put in front of me. I fought the number one guys, period. I fought literally, I, I had a, like an amateur title after like four fights, five fights. And then I fought the number one guy in the in the, the whole Northeast, which was Ken Moy at the time, who was like, you know, he had a, the yeah. AFO title that we fought. I fought him and and Ken's really, really good. You know what I mean? He ended up having a really good pro career as well, but he just retired not too long ago. But I, I, as an amateur, I was fighting really good guys. And that, the people down to Rise of Warrior, that tournament is solid. It's still going today. That was like over 10 years ago. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that show is doing really, really well. It just shows like a lot of quality guys. Yeah, and, and you had a long, not, not super duper long, but you had a pretty fair amateur career. What were you, 11-3 and three or 9-3, and three, something along those lines? So it's not like you're a spring chicken yeah. when it comes to this MMA game. Do you know no, what I absolutely. Mean, so? Yeah, I think I had like I think I was fourteen and three, something like that, as an amateur. S- yeah, something around there. I knew it was something something along that. Um, but I know fighting is super chaotic to the point where sometimes you can't really gather your thoughts, especially when the fight is actually going on. But if you could remember, what were some of the thoughts going back to the corner after round one? After you probably dropped the round, but smashing them to bits with the elbows. So what were some of the thoughts going back to the back to the corner? So the biggest thing for me in that was all right. Going at, first of all, right off the rip, I thought I was going to win the fight because I was throwing those elbows and I, I cut them and he kind of went limp. I think it was after the third or fourth. Mm. So I kind of gave up position a little bit to kind of keep throwing the elbows because I'm like, here's the risk reward, right? Like I could knock him out right now if I could be over or he takes me down. You know what I mean? So I keep throwing the elbows. He kind of pumps back. I think he works off a single leg and I ended up getting taken down, but it was, it was worth it. Cause he was like that close to going out. I kind of woke him back up, but I cut him mm-hmm. pretty good. So just oh, even yeah. cut, just cutting him real good like that and keep working that. And coach Kavanaugh told me, cause they already fought, um, he fought Brad Katona, you know, yeah. so they, he, he already has a little bit of history with him. So he told me, he's like, listen, this kid's a really good wrestler. This, that, what he's like, you got to make it nasty Rico. He's like, I was like, enough said, I know how to do yes. that. You know what I mean? No, for real. Like I know how to make it a fight. And I have no problem doing that. So it's like, you're going to have to throw elbows off your back in places that you'd be usually working to get an underhook or getting up. And this is he's like, this kid's going to be really tough to get up from ball. You got to make it nasty. You got to hit him with stuff. You got to like, you know, create distance by being, you know, physically nasty with punches from places you usually wouldn't throw. Cause it's, it makes it harder to get up. And usually you're going to take shots to get up. You know what I mean? In those situations. Sure. So, but you know, that's the risk, you know, you got to take it sometimes with certain opponents, you know what I mean? You got to be willing to do that. Nah. Going into the second corner, the biggest thing was I got up and I screamed. It doesn't really show the clip, and I was just like, I, I, got, I, I saw that. 
So you can't really see it because it's like on the side and I start screaming and then my nose was busted. So I, I did like a snot rocket, right? Yeah. And the, the, the guy comes over, the uh, the cut man, he's like, don't blow, don't blow, don't blow. And I'm already like halfway out and I you know, huck out a huge thing of blood. There's another thing that people don't see. They think it was Hunter spitting, but it was actually his blood leaking in my mouth. So I kept yeah. like, I kept like spitting to the side. And then like uh, Herb Dean was like, don't do that. And then he realized like his blood's leaking in my mouth. So I'm spitting. He's like, all right, it's okay. Because it's just, it's just gnarly. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> was... I, actually, I, I wanted to ask you about that too. Because I thought it was because your nose was broken. And I didn't know if you were choking on blood. Because I saw you was spitting. And then I heard Big... him say, whoa, 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 oh, wait a minute. No, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. It was and, a little then... bit of both for sure. Yeah. But like, the... his, it was literally like dropping in my mouth. Like, oh, yeah. it's gross. Like, like it Chandler gross. and Dustin. Like if you remember yeah. Chandler and Dustin, that was naughty. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. The way they cut it, obviously TV editing, but if because maybe because I watched the fight four times already, but right before they cut it, you they I, well, I personally saw you get up and it looked like you screamed something, but they cut it just so you were walking back and you looked like you were a little like dazed because you were like blowing your nose and trying to hold it. So yeah, it was a weird angle, but I did yeah. notice that as well. It sounded like you did say something when you got up. Yeah. So yeah, and then I you know fucking shoot rock and start screaming, get a little lightheaded because I'm like you know just on the ground and everything that takes place, yeah. but. And it's funny because it like it was literally just from me being a fucking asshole and just trying to get hype. You know what I'm saying? So then yeah. I get back to the corner and you know they gave me great advice. You know, real, but the thing was, I already knew what I had to do at that point. Like keep them off the keep keep myself off the cage. Once I start mm -hmm. stuffing a couple of takedowns, will be huge. And I did a lot of drilling with um, Connor's wrestling coach. That like he gave me a couple of little details on the single leg, literally like the night before, that made a huge difference. Shout out to Sergey. You know, he 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 hooked it up for real. Like. Mm -hmm. It's little, little, little things, especially if I get, if you got too deep on the single, too deep in a shot, like bumping up his hips, opening up his elbows, like little things that made a big difference. Like, and once I stuffed him in the open, I was like, oh, he ain't touching me at all now. Like it's, it's not mm -hmm. happening. He can't, can't get me to the cage, stuffing takedowns in the open. Now you're in my world and you're stuck there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I could feel like his demeanor and things changing because he didn't, I don't know, I was my angles, I was hitting shots, I was hitting them with, you know, side changing things. Yeah, and even, like you said, even the shots up the middle as well. Like, you, those little details make a difference, but it's just the shots up the middle you were showing. I think you yeah. hit him with a, with a nice uppercut uh, in the first round, and he, I saw him kind of hesitate a little bit because he didn't like what happened to him there. But uh, those, like you said, those little details that go unnoticed, but those make the big differences in the fight. Yeah, and in the corner going to that second round, they were like, Kian was like, listen, be the sniper that you are, man. Be a, be a sniper, yeah. you know what I mean? D don't get crazy. Don't get riled up because maybe you can you know, overextend and get, t get taken down. He's like, keep him at your distance and just snipe him out. You're going to take his head off. And then I think it was uh, Phil's like, make him miss, make him pay. You're going to knock him out. Just make him miss. And he's, he's, yeah. uh, Connor's uh, boxing coach, he just gets you hyped. And like, that guy, incredibly, incredibly good boxing, you know, and he knows, like, so working with him, like, he pointed me out right off the rip because I can box lefty and righty. So he was mm -hmm. like, I worked with him right off the rip and um, he was giving me like a lot of good insight. And uh, he just, he's just all around fantastic coaches everywhere. You know what I mean? So it's like, mm -hmm. if you're not comfortable there, I don't know what to tell you. Right, exactly. Uh, but with that said, is there maybe a story or two you could tell us that maybe we didn't get to see uh, on camera or on, uh, on the show? Mm -hmm. uh, if it already passed, maybe I don't know if they're going to use it. I just don't want to get in trouble because I know that they, no, I got you. They'll, 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 but I could maybe something little, but like they might show it. So there's really not much I can say until after. Afterwards, we'll do this again. I'll let you know because there's going to be a bunch of things they missed. There's yeah, going to be like sure. there's going to be like a million things that were absolutely awesome that I, yeah. I can't that were all like shit in our pants. Like I can't prove they didn't air this, and mm -hmm. I think it's just because they only have so much time they have to get to the fights. But yeah. after the after the show airs, I'll let you know whatever. Once I get my paper, I'll be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, Once we'll I get paid. with you. Because, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if you know him, but uh, Mitch Raposo, he was also on the show yeah. last year. And he's been my best friend since since the fourth grade. I'm actually wearing, oh, wearing really? one of his fight t-shirts. Yeah, he's been oh, one of my awesome. best friends since I was a little kid. He's a good dude. And, uh, oh, dude, he's awesome. He's the best flyweight in the world. Yeah, um, but, but he came back and told me stories. And it's similar to what you said. He was like, bro, you guys don't even know the half of the stories that was oh, going yeah. on. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's craziness. But uh, taking a quick side street here, uh, going off of Ultimate Fighter. How's the volume ask, though? I just look at, how's the volume with them doing pad work? Is it all right? Yeah, no. It, to me, it's good. I don't, I don't oh, hear cool. nothing. Okay, cool. Um, and if not, we'll edit it out. Not a big deal. Um, but taking a quick side street here. Talk to us a little about your contender series fight. You are nine and one going up against a seriously tough dude in Montel Jackson, who's still doing really well in the UFC right now. Yeah. You didn't come up with the win. But what what did you take back from the experience? And do you think they played a small role in your we recent win streak coming into the show? And of course, that highlight right uh, highlight real knockout. 
Yeah, man. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bad loser, but I take the, the, I take the knowledge with me. What you learn from it, you know what I'm saying? But that fight was really, really, really frustrating. You know, I got eye gouged right off the rip, real bad, and the ref didn't even see it. Then I got eye gouged again. He saw it. I got hit in the nuts a couple of times. They, they penalized them. I, I got hit in the back of the head. I honestly think it was probably one of the most penalized fights in UFC history. If you look back on it, I think they had like five or six penalties in it. But um, the one that was the worst was the eye. And it wasn't on purpose. You know, I kind of got pissed off. It was emotional probably the day after, like, fuck you, you're a dirty fighter. You know, yeah. I don't think, I look back at it, I watch, like, I don't think he, he was, like, malicious or dirty. It's just that moment's a little funky. And, um, you know, it's the first time walking out with no music, no sound. You know, it's very kind of eerie. Um, I think that's kind of what, I think that also helped me on the on the, the tough this, this season was, like, I love that. I don't even like, I almost embrace that. Like anything that makes somebody else a little more comfortable, like that's good for me. I don't care. Cause I've been there. I've done it. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like I already experienced that. Uh, and plus, you know, just, just leaving, leaving the contender with that bad taste in my mouth and not being able to get fights after because of COVID and my knee surgery. So I was like, I couldn't even get back to the window. I couldn't have had a fight for like years after it was like my last fight. It made me sick. You know what I mean? So it was like, but it was good motivation. It was like something that burned inside me for so long that like made me come back. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I got two mm. kids now and I got like, family. I, I could have easily, you know, walked away from the sport and done the, you know, the family business thing and try to, you know, I just, I knew I wouldn't be happy. You know what I mean? It just, I, there's something in my soul. I just like, it, it was, I couldn't do it. You know what I mean? I would always regret it and it would just not make me the best person I can be. You know what I mean? And, and realistically, when I know I have so much more to give, you know what I mean? Like I, I yeah. have so much more in me to, to, you know, for the MMA community to, to, to view it and, and enjoy, you know, cause I feel like I got some highlight knockouts coming up, man. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to ride it into the sunset as long as I can do it. As long as I'm healthy and as long as I can do it, I'm going, That's you know, it. And I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to keep my foot on that pedal. Yeah. And just keep it going. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. Uh, in my last question, I mean, what was it like driving not only a Lambo, but Connor's Lambo? You got you, you to you tap, tap me in with that. What's going Yo, on with that? It was dope. So I'll give you a little inside information on this one. So it was dope. It was super spur of the moment. It was literally the day after our training set, after our fight. I don't even think I was, I mean, I wasn't even really scheduled to train because, like, I just fought, I think it was, like, day before or whatever. It's, but I just, you know, I showed up, whatever we trained. And, like, right after, I was just, you know, kind of busting his balls. Like, oh, let me take a peek at it. I thought we were going to go inside and look at it, whatever. He talked to the keys. Right when we, right when we pull out. I think everybody kind of gets a little frantic because there wasn't that many cameras there. And the people like probably radio and like, shit, we can't let this kid drive away in the Lambo. We didn't know this kid's got a fucking license. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like, I like, see people like someone, he's like, go, go. I'm like, oh, I'm fucking, I'm hitting it. All right. And like, we get around the corner. So I'm like, yo, I'm going to, I'm going to put my foot down. Is that cool? It's like, yeah, get on it a little bit. I fucking just dump it. Like, I mean, I dump it. He's like, ah. Yo, he shit his pants. He, he he downplayed it probably, but like he was he was shook a little bit because now he's probably thinking, I don't even know what the fuck this kid can drive or not. Like, yeah. and we're in the parking lot, so like it's tight, and I'm fucking zipping like it's a like it's a drag strip. Yeah, and like, right. oh man, dude, it was that was cool as shit. He was recording, so at the time we couldn't listen to any music. You know, we can't listen to nothing. You know, I'm sure Mitch told you, you got no books, you can't yeah. listen to music, you got nothing. So. He starts playing some music. He's like, we're blasting Biggie and shit. Then he's like recording on his phone. He's like, I'm with Don Rico. And I'm like, and, I'm, and he's recording. I'm just like, oh man, if this shit, I can't wait. I hope he keeps that video for after I fucking <laughs> knock this dude out. And then he plays it. That shit will be epic. But yeah, right. I don't know. I don't know if he still got it. I'll actually, I'll hit him up and see if he has it. Cause that shit would be hilarious. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> awesome. It was um, a good time. When we, yeah. When we tap back in with you, we'll play after uh, see if you get the footage of that. But, uh, oh, I mean, absolutely. For sure. But I mean, that's about it for me, man. Is there anyone you want to shout out or thank before we sign off here? I mean, just my just my training partners throughout the year. You know what I mean? Like, I think he just walked in. One of my boys from forever. Dude, I've trained with him since he moved to Japan. He was living here, like in in the gym, trying to go to school. Dude, and my boy Tateki Matsuda. He's in the background doing some work with Eddie Alvarez. Yep. I'm over there right now. Um, to Mark Delagradi, everybody from City of Tom over the years. You know, that's helped me. Broadway BJJ. John Clark, Kyle Bokniak, you know, my squad that, you know, pretty much brought me in through COVID. Rob Font did a big job, literally pulled me out of, the, out of, out of nowhere. It was like, we could, like take him to different gyms just to do privates to get me back into fighting. You know what I mean? So I have much love for Rob, man. Me and him came up in the sport together pretty much. You know what I mean? We fought a million times together over at Sid at Mean Mature. And, 
you know, I honestly, I wasn't, I don't even think, I don't know if I would have jumped back into the sport during COVID and everything that was happening if he didn't pull me out and like get me, start, start getting me back, you know, back on. And uh, just all the people around me that care about me and like, like I've been in the sport from the beginning, you know, so it's just huge because, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, that are so tight to me that have kind of kept me going because of their belief in me. You know what I'm saying? So that's such a big thing. And uh, my boy, Charles Rosa, my buddy, Chris Lemon, rest in peace, brother. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. All right, man. Beautifully said. Uh, I appreciate you tapping in with us. Uh, Let's link up uh, after. I'll see what I can give you. Bro, 100%. 100%. I'll hit you up in a couple of weeks when the show ends. Yeah. And we'll there's, there's, there's a lot of shit. I, well, well you'll, you'll get some laughs for sure. Say less. That sounds good, bro. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for tapping in. All right. Later, bro.